Wonderful. So got that all set up. I've got this logged in here. Let me pull my slides up and we'll get started on those. Um, and I will try to get the slides published and put on Canvas roughly half an hour before lecture starts. Um, some people really like printing them off and taking notes right on the lecture. So if you wanted to go do that, you know, you could do, um, at the library or something like that, or if you just want to have them up on your computer um, and then take notes next to them, um, that's that's why I make them available on on Canvas, and then obviously the the video too after the fact. Right. Cool. And full disclaimer, I'm very out of practice at all this because it's been last time I taught was last fall. Um, and I've been home with home with my son. My youngest was born last August. My wife took fall quarter off, and then I, I had enough sick leave built up by this point that I was able to do something I wasn't able to do with my other two, which was actually take time off to stay home with the kid for a little bit. Um, and then my sabbatical project was already planned for spring and then summer. So it's been full nine months since I've been in the classroom. So uh, please excuse the rest. Um, but in general, it's, you know, I rely pretty heavily on, on lecture and um, discussion and practice problems, working stuff out with y'all. Um, but it's a fairly traditional classroom setup. Uh, so we're going to try to do a little bit of review today, talk about some, some stuff. And then today's lab is going to be, um, it's going to be basically practice drawing structures on a computer. Because while drawing by hand is great for taking notes and for you know impromptu discussions and being able to do that is great. Um, if everybody's going into a scientific field that requires this class, you're probably going to have to draw a chemical structure at some point in the future that needs to look relatively professional. So we're going to talk about that and how to do how to draw these structures well and how to get a 3D structure out of a 2D drawing. Um, and do some practice with that in the lab today. So it'll be a computer-based lab today. Um, we do have some loaner laptops there, but let's see, at least at least four of you have laptops here. Excuse me. Um, but we do have, and, and for in the future, we do have four Windows-based loaner laptops in the lab at all times. So if you forget your laptop in it on any given day, with the class this size, it's actually really nice because odds are one of the five of you will have a laptop at any given point, which means we have enough for everybody as long as one of you has one. And if that doesn't happen, then we, you know, um, win the golden sombrero when nobody has any laptops, then I do have my own laptop that can be um, loaned out as needed too. So um, some other FAQs that I pulled from other classes, I think that everybody being a second year student knows a lot of these tricks. Um, we talked about recordings. Um, I'm going to be a little bit of a stickler on trying to get everybody to turn in. Like I said, drawing structures in OCHEM is a huge part of it. You can't do a whole lot in this class without turning in your assignments, and most of those are going to be hand-drawn. Um, and I'm going to request that those be done as PDFs rather than just as JPEGs from your phone if you're turning it in digitally, um, mostly because getting four or five different files and trying to keep them in order when the, and the image viewer on Canvas is greater, doesn't work well with JPEGs, it handles PDFs brilliantly. Um, so I'm gonna try to get everybody in the habit of doing everything as PDF. Um, if you're using uh, Apple products, then there's actually a scanner app built in these days. I have to find it, but then there's a scanner app for Android and most other stuff. I use one called Cam Scanner. It's, uh, there's a paid version that's like five bucks, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, and all it does is it turns your camera into a into a scanner. So you take you know one picture, two picture, three picture, four picture, crosses them, saves it all as one PDF, interacts directly with the Canvas app. So you can just hit share, click on the Canvas app on your phone, pick your assignment, turn it in. Really straightforward. Um, I don't mind getting stuff on paper. I really like, I'm bad about getting stuff graded quickly and back to you when it comes to stuff like homework. Um, so it, 
if you're going to want to study from it and like going back to your assignments and looking at it again, it's better for you to do it digitally because then one, it's time stamped and I can't lose it. And two, there's you you get to keep the original when it comes to studying or if we go over problems later in class, that kind of thing. Um, we're not going to do a whole lot with calculators. I don't you know, it may be a surprise to you, but OCAM actually has very, very little in the way of math that we're going to do at this level. Advanced OCAM and some of the stuff that goes into deriving what we talked about in OCAM, so the instruments and stuff like that, there is math behind it. Most of the math we will do in this class will be in the form of, of Excel and in analyzing data in Excel when it comes to stuff like um, IR spectra, um, different instruments, almost every instrument that we use in OCAM. Um, the most basic way it exports things is it's going to give you an X and a Y variable, and you're going to wind up having basically a graph that you can plot yourself. Um, and we'll go over all that and, and do practice with that when we start doing some of these, these instrumental analysis stuff. Um, but for the most part, percent yield is about the, the only real math that we're going to do on a regular basis in here. So basic stoichiometry, molecular weight. And the nice thing about stoichiometry for OCHEM is it's pretty much always going to be one-to-one -one when it comes to products versus reactants. Very rarely do you have a reaction in OCHEM where you start with one reactant and make two products or something like that. Um, just by the nature of the fact that we're dealing with molecular structures or tweaking one part of a molecular structure, you wind up basically with the same molecule back that you ended started with, with one extra atom added to it. So there's really not a whole lot of ways that the stoichiometry can get that complicated when you're starting with molecular structure and ending with molecular structure. Um, you can think of it like, I don't know, like, um, modding a car or something like that. You started with a car, you ended with a fancier car, but you can't wind up with two cars. Um, so that makes makes the math part and the calculator pretty redundant. You don't need a whole lot of help with that. We'll talk a lot about conceptual math, like things like rates and slopes, area under the curve, but we're not actually gonna do any of that math by hand. Um, turns out, the, the math folks don't always like that I te that I teach the secret. Um, you don't really need to know how to integrate things because if you wind up with a figure that looks like do it on the on the screen so that I should just break this over here. Excel or uh, PowerPoint updated what I was going at. Don't there it is. Um, if you have a a function that looks like it's weird that it doesn't show me line as I'm drawing it anymore. Um, we'll deal with a, a, an instrument called a gas chromatograph in this class. It's basically a way of separating organic compounds out and figuring out what their relative ratios are to each other. And you get some a graph that looks like this out of it, where this is just basically called intensity. It's unitless for the most part. And here you get time. Um, each of these peaks that you get represents a different compound. And if you want to know what the relative ratio of what the mole fraction of each compound is in this um, all you have to do is find the area under that peak relative to the total area, which is both of the peaks added together, um, which sounds like calculus because it is, right? That's taking the integral, finding the area under a curve, but that's not a nice, neat function that we can actually integrate by hand. Um, so what we do is we turn this data into an Excel sheet and you just do, a, you just do, everybody remember when you first learned, has everybody had calculus? at least Calc 1, if, even if it's been a while. Um, I mean, well, the way that, that you learn integrals in the area under the curve in the first place is basically treat it like it's a, you're going to approximate it by saying, okay, I'm going to find, treat this as a rectangle with a certain height and width. And you do that and you find and you add up all of the rectangles under, under a curve and add up all those areas, you get an approximation of the area under the curve, right? So calculus says, okay, well, what if we made that that change in X really, really small, we make it infinitesimally small, 
just like you do finding the derivative of something. And that's how you get analytical integrals. You can actually um, integrate things. But the thing is, modern instruments put out so many data points. It puts out a data point. You know, this might be, this whole bit run might be, we call it 10 minutes. And this instrument is putting out one data point every third of a second. So that means that really we can just actually do this approximation, take the height times times the change in time, add up all the squares, and you get you get uh, the area under the curve. So that's that's like the trickiest math we'll do in this class. Um, and we'll do that fairly often because this is actually a really useful tool for separating out compounds. Um, and it's a really useful trick to know how to find a integral without actually doing any calculus. Um, call that a numerical approximation, but as long as dx is small enough, it's really, really close to the real answer. I taught that one time and, and uh, three of my students dropped dif differential equations and, and Bruce got mad at me. Um, so don't do that, but anyway, so not a whole lot of other math that we're going to be doing. Um, and like I said, we have McMurray 10th edition as the, as our textbook here, which is great. Um, it's not that the full edition is not published yet. They, in order to get it ready for all the classes starting this fall, they put out the first 12 chapters are ready and published and have been since the end of July. The rest of it is getting published officially sometime in September was their date, but they'll have print versions of the full textbook. Um, which is like 34 chapters. So we've got the first third of it, which is all we need for this class for right now. And PDF is available for free. Um, and it's like 39 bucks. If you want a print copy, you can order it directly from OpenStax and they'll print it and ship it to you. It's basically just the cost of shipping and printing. Um, they're not taking a cut because they're a nonprofit whose job is get cheap textbooks to students. Um, so if you like, I ordered a print copy that's on its way. Um, but the PDF version is all you really need. And frankly, I use both of them when I'm when I'm preparing things because I want a digital copy for, um, you know, so I can control that and find certain terms and um, or grabbing the various figures and things like that. But I like reading a print copy like most people. It's easier on the eyes to read on a page rather than on a screen. Um, but that means that, you know, you have to you know, spend the... 40 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever it is to get it here and shipped. But, um, and then the full version will be available soon. And that's what we use for that for the rest of the course as well, once it's out. Um, if anybody needs a Chromebook, if your computer goes out at any point, um, you just don't want to use your personal computer for, for school. I think we do still have a Chromebook lending program, but it's, the Chromebook, it's not a real computer when it comes to operating system and installing stuff. Um, but if you do need that or for whatever, for any class, um, the library, I think, is still running the Chromebook lending program and they'll just check it out to you for a full quarter if you need it. Uh, tutoring, um, how many of you know Cody Simmons? Um, he was a tutor for chemistry last year. He's helping do all the lab prep with Mariola. Uh, I think he's going to be our tutor again this year. Um, but he should be around a lot because he really loves OCHEM. And I, I have to like kick him out of labs sometimes. Um, so I, if I had to guess, I'd say he's going to be around a lot in lab. You'll get to see him in lab a lot. Um, but we'll get actual hours established once we know his schedule as far as his classes go. Um, but he'll, he will also be the tutor for this class because um, he's taken it and, and uh, done all the labs. And he actually helped me by workshopping all of the labs um, that I was writing over the summer, um, I would just send them to him and Mario, and he would, and they would go in and and troubleshoot it for me. So he has a lot of experience with the labs as well. Um, so, and then I will leave a discussion board up. I hope that with the class of five, we can just talk to each other. But if you are, you know, middle of the night, and you want to write something before you forget, ask a question before you forget, I'll leave a, a discussion board open on Canvas, um, just so you have that. But I mean, I. It usually is kind of a ghost town because for the most part, y'all know where to find where to find me and where to find each other. So 
um, shouldn't be that critical. And I don't think we're not going to do any sort of great discussions on discussion boards or anything like that. So any questions so far? Pared down version of, of uh, the Gen Chem syllabus day talk. Um, one thing that I will, that may have changed since some of you had me as, as a teacher, um, we're gonna have quizzes. Instead of having homework assignments, we're gonna call them quizzes so that I can run them through Canvas. They're all gonna be online. They're all gonna be open note and they don't have a time limit. And so it's really kind of like a, more like a homework assignment than a quiz, but to, to get it to do what I want is on Canvas. I have to call it a quiz. Um, but basically there's going to be, I'm gonna make you think about chemistry between Thursday at noon and Tuesday at 10. You could conceivably have you know four and a half, five days without thinking about chemistry. That's a long time to lose all the stuff we just talked about, right? Um, so the goal with these quizzes is um, I'm going to only open them up a few hours after lecture ends on Thursdays, and you have to finish them sometime over the weekend. Usually I make the deadline, um, you know, Sunday at midnight. Um, basically the idea is so that you don't go those full five days, because there's been a lot of research on learning and memory retention that suggests that if you're asked to recall something that you just learned or a skill that you just practiced, somewhere between six and 24 hours after you first learn it, um, you retain that information long-term a lot better than if you just practice right away when you're done, or if you come back to it more than 24 hours later. Um, so, which kind of makes sense, right? Being asked to come go back and do something that you just learned is, is the number one way of, of learning and retaining stuff. Um, that said, I know that people's schedules are weird and not weird, wrong word, are very busy, mine is as well, so I get that. Um, so I do allow you all weekend. I don't force you to be that six hours, 24 hours later um, time frame, but just sometime over the weekend, I want you to think about chemistry, what we learned. And as, as usual with my classes, um, two points out of the 10 for each of these quizzes is just going to be ask me a question about chemistry. It can be random chemistry application. It can be a, you said this in class, is that why X happens out in the wild? Um, you know, try to apply stuff that we're talking about to real world situations. Um, but the number one thing is, is that's your chance to privately um, ask me like, hey, I really don't understand this. Can you talk about that again? Or can you redo that practice problem? Or I didn't get number two on this quiz. I feel like I'm totally lost. I answered it, but um, I really, really want you to go over that in class. It's a chance for you to, without having to speak up in front of everybody else, um, ask for, for help or ask me to go over a topic. Um, and again, hopefully with the class this small, we all feel comfortable enough with each other that we can just raise our hands in real time. But um, I get that sometimes that's awkward and that's not everybody's cup of tea. So um, those ask me anything is your perfect chance to <laughs> can't come to office hours, don't want to speak up in class, ask me there. So that kind of gives me a barometer on how well we're doing recovering the material. Usually if I get, if five out of five of you ask random chemistry questions that have nothing to do with the material, I'm gonna assume that that's because the material is boring and you're so far beyond that right now that we should just be moving faster. If everybody's asking a question about the material, that means we're going too fast and I need to slow down and yeah, but if I had a mixture of a few, a few of you are like, oh, okay, I got that material. I'm going to ask a random question. A few of you are asking for clarification. That's one way that I sort of judge the pace of the class um, as well. So let me know if you think it's going too fast or too slow. Um, let me know what your questions are, that kind of thing, um, in person or, or on the campus quizzes. Um, we don't aren't going to have a whole lot of homework beyond the quizzes in this class. There'll be a few times where if the quiz is basically just doing the same thing over and over again, sometimes it's easier for me to just make it a PDF and send it out to you rather than write it, put it in the form of three different questions on Canvas. Um, so that might be called a uh, homework that I might give you more than just the weekend to work on it if it's a longer one. Um, so there'll be a couple of homework assignments, but for the most part, I'm going to rely on those quizzes to sort of assess where we are on a week to week basis. 
Um, and we'll just do lots of examples that are going to be ungraded and not a full assignment um, when it comes to in class. Um, happy students learn better. I like this because this gives me an excuse to talk about random chemistry applications. Um, but really, it's, it's um, part of what this study was looking at is if we can sort of switch your mindset from whatever stress you have outside of this classroom, whatever else is going on in your life, if you bring that in here, you're going to be thinking about that instead of chemistry. And even worse, in my mind, you're going to start to associate chemistry with all these other crappy things that might be happening in your life. Um, I don't want that because chemistry is fun. It doesn't need to be tied up in all the other baggage of what's, what you've got going on. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I start with random chemistry icebreakers, talk about random science topics, um, answering your random questions from the quizzes is so that when you walk in here, the first thing we do is just talk about stuff that makes you excited. Um, and then we'll get into the material, but that kind of gives you a chance to switch your brain over from outside the classroom mode to OCHEM mode um, in a way that kind of should hopefully create positive associations and put you in the mood to and be not moved in the right frame of mind to learn and obtain and think about this stuff. Um, so there actually is a reason for my tangents at the beginning of class. It's not just that I like talking about it. Right? You know, um, and, stuff. and then this is something I really drive home in my, um, in my Gen Chem class because there's a lot more math, but, you know, reminder, should try to treat your be generous to yourself and kind to yourself and get rid of having a fixed mindset. Fixed mindset is the idea that whatever you're good or bad at is permanent and doesn't really change. Um, so the one that I hear a lot, especially in Gen Chem, is I'm bad at math. You're not bad at math. You're bad at math right now. You're not good at math yet. You know, I need to work, you may need to work on certain things. That doesn't mean you're bad at them full stop. Um, and it's a really, really, you know, cliche thing to say, um, but it does actually have proven effects. You can start to just add yet. I'm, I don't get this yet. When you make those statements to me, um, that actually does have a long-term effect on your psyche and how well you retain material and the way you view yourself as something I can get good at anything when you get practice at it. Um, if you ask, if you ask others, I may be too good at that because I'm pretty convinced I can learn anything um, and get good at anything, which means I spend a lot more of my spare time on fixing my furnace myself rather than calling the experts. Um, but I fix my furnace. So, you know, you can learn anything if you start with this and it seems it's really basic and I'll help you if I hear it and you're like, I got to get this. And you're going to get very annoyed with me because I'm always going to say yet um, until you start saying it when you tell me, um, say these things to me. So um, just sort of a little bit about, about how we're going to try and run the class and the attitude. Um, main thing on here is our grade distribution assignments, meaning labs and those random homework assignments are going to be 30% of the grade. Um, quizzes are going to be 30%. The exams, there's going to be a midterm and a final um, about the, the lecture material. And then there will also be a lab final that will be 10%. Um, that will be basically one of the lab procedures that we go through during the course of the um, course of the term. You'll have a few weeks at the end of the term that where you have to write out your own procedure um, get your own data, troubleshoot if you run into any issues. It'll basically be the same lab you've already done, um, except with a different compound. It's a steam distillation, um, which you may have done in, in Chem 103, where um, the, the classic examples are you either take lemon peel or you take cloves, and you boil it and you collect the vapor that comes off, and then you do some purification and you get lemon oil or clove oil. Um, so it's You'll have done that, and then we'll say, okay, well then, here's coriander. Do the same thing, um, and get the coriander oil. But every different compound, every different plant has its own unique issues. Like, um, you know, if you cinnamon sticks really foam up like crazy when you try and do this, they boil like like mad, and you wind up with your own little wrinkles. 
And so having to go back and write your own procedure, troubleshoot it a little bit, then get your data and do some analysis, some of the instrumental analysis uh, on an unknown is what that lab find will be. So it won't be like a closed book. You walk into a lab and I ask you to identify glassware um, by name or something like that. It's a it's a longer project. It'll be two or three weeks long um, at the end of our at the end of our term. Um, and just like um, most of my classes, um, the the exams I will have a, a either a study guide or a practice test um, for you a week ahead of time for you to go through and. Uh, and the structure won't change that much. So if you can do the practice test, if you're comfortable with the structure of the practice test, then the, find, then the exam is going to look really, really similar, just with different specific questions, um, just so that there's not any, like, I don't know what the test is going to look like anxiety, um, because that's I know that's a case where people tend to freeze up. They get an unfamiliar test in a high-stress environment, and it doesn't look like what they were expecting it to look like. That's not fair, that's not a good way of assessing how well you know the material. So I'll try to make sure that you're very aware. I think for the final, the way I have it set up is a study guide rather than a practice test, just because the questions that I need to ask on the final don't lend themselves to having a practice test very well. Um, but there will be a study guide instead, and it'll still be a, a homework assignment where you just go through and do some practice problems. Um, but for the most part, no surprises when it comes to the tests, and you'll have plenty of warning um, about what you're walking into. Um, and then last but not least, this is second year class, but I still have to have this talk about cheating. Um, just stay away from Chegg, especially stuff like Chegg, asking questions on forums. Um, I see all those, I hang out on all the chem on chemistry forums and stuff like that. Um, and it's really, really disheartening when I see my own questions pop up as a, who can help me solve this? Um, you know, it makes me not want to do open book stuff because um, if I can't rely on you to actually do your own stuff. That's it. This is a second year class. You all should be fine. You know the rules. Um, and anything that I give you that I want you specifically to not ask questions about on forums, um, I will make a point of, of explaining that and um, go over that. So for, there's a take-home component, at least to the final. Um, and But on that sheet, it has a list of, here's what's okay, working in groups, talking to, talking to Sean. Um, here's what's not okay, going to the tutors, posting questions online and getting answers from somebody else that's not in the class. Um, and we'll go through more of that in more detail, but basically, it's not worth it. You guys are going to put so much work and effort into this class. You don't want to jeopardize that just be for an extra five points on fine. It's not worth it because it will cost you and it's a hassle for me and it you know, depletes my faith in humanity and um, why I do what I do. So just don't do that. You're causing me existential harm by doing that. Um, so remember, it's not just about you. It's about me too. Um, due dates and late work. I always put like a week long. A due date is, is almost always going to be a week week from when I give you the assignment. Um, so for labs, if we're going to do a lab on a Tuesday, it'll be due next Tuesday, generally speaking. There's a few of our, week, our labs that are multi-week, so we'll handle those on a case-by-case -case basis, and I'll try to keep the due dates updated on Canvas. Um, that's it. Canvas's auto date function messes with things sometimes. So if it seems like Hey, we're doing this lab today and it says it's due today. That's probably just because I haven't updated it. So just let me know and I'll fix that. Um, or I'll tell you, no, I want you to finish this one before you can leave, uh, which is, I don't think I do that very often, but there are a few times where I will like, no, you should finish this just to stay on, on course. Um, anyway, and I do accept late work. Um, don't make a habit of it. And, and, is I do take points off and it's really hard to get an A in the class if all of your assignments are turned in and have 50 automatic 50% off on them. Um, usually what it is, is I take off 10% per, per, um, per lecture late um, up to a maximum of 50% off per assignment. Uh, so you can, I usually do still accept stuff all the way to the very end. Um, but it's, you're not setting yourself up for success because you're also not doing the studying uh, or even 
For whatever reason, some people do the assignments but just don't turn them in. Um, I would much rather have an on-time 90% complete homework assignment than a perfect one that's two weeks late because that just keeps us on track schedule-wise. Um, even if you want to go over that last 10%, you want to turn it in, but then still talk about the last 10% um, that you didn't understand, that's great. Turn it in 90% done, but on time um, is generally a healthier option there. That said, don't forget to ask about that last 10%. I do still want to talk to you, talk and do those practices. All right. Uh, this is all stuff I've already said. Uh, everybody's going to get to know each other really well because it's a small class and it requires a lot of time and has lab components. So we're going to spend a lot of time. Um, there's a lot of downtime in OCHEM labs too. There's a lot of spend 20 minutes, set up this glassware setup, add your reactants, and then just watch it boil for 40 minutes. Um, that's kind of the nature of how OCHEM labs work. And so there's a lot of uh, sort of downtime. It's a good time to to work on some practice problems. I don't care if you're working on stuff for other classes either, um, but if you see that it's gonna be one of those labs, it's always good to have something so you're not just sitting there literally watching water boil um, because that's kind of frustrating after a while. Uh, office hours, all my office hours are in the mornings. I'm here at nine every, or Monday through Thursday, I'm here at 9 a.m. Um, so on Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's nine to 10, so, um, until right before this class. Mondays and Wednesdays, it's nine to 10.30, but you can always find me here. I'm usually here before that, and I'm usually here on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'll be here after class for a while as well, um, but I just can't. The time that's guaranteed, that's carved out to my family schedule and my, my real life, not my real life, my outside of LTCC life, is nine to 10, nine to 10.30 on Mondays through Thursdays. And if you can't make that time, let me know. We can set something up on Zoom. You can do it by email. You can do it in class, um, whatever works. But make use of those office hours. Remember, office hours are there. It just doesn't mean I'm doing office work. I probably am. That doesn't mean I'm scheduled 9 to 10 in the morning is when I do my office work. It means that that's when my door is open. I'm guaranteed to be in my office here for you to come ask questions. That's the whole point of office hours. Um, so feel free to come find me. I'm still in the cubicles um, across from the chem lab um, where Carl's office is and where Sue Boss's office is right now. Um, so when we go out to the labs, later, the chem lab later, which is the G buildings, we're still out in the, the old dance studio over there. Um, and just across the way is G2A, which is where all the science faculty are while they finish up our offices. Um, so it's really, you know, if you're doing other science classes, it's pretty convenient to stop by. You probably see all of your science instructors at once um, to get stuff answered. Because I think there's still six of us in there. Me, Carl, Benaz, Sue, Kathy Cox, and Scott Valentine. So the only science faculty that's not there with us is Bruce, because he gets the fancy new corner office upstairs by himself. Um, which he's earned. He shared an office with Larry Green for 20 years. That he deserves a medal, not just a quarter <laughs> office. I love Larry, but I don't think I could share an office with him. All right, just one more thing about the course structure in, um, is I find it helpful to kind of explain sort of a, you know, this is the, uh, um, the making, of, making the sausage of how you build a course. Uh, it seems like from the student perspective, I remember being really frustrated when I had classes that were just like, there's no homework graded, there's no assignments, all that you do is show up, take a test at the, at the end, and that's, that's it, that's your grade. Um, that's really frustrating as a student. Um, and I never build my tests, my courses like that, but just one of the reasons that you end up with a course structure like that are some of these other things that the instructors are actually thinking about. How do I actually assess how well they know the material? So you can't rely on homework because everybody works in groups on homework and turns in stuff that they may or may not actually understand. We know that as teachers. Um, how do I teach life skills like staying on deadline, like showing up, like being here, like not you know cutting out halfway through and showing up for the final? Um, most of your instructors really, really like whatever they're talking about too, right? So we want to find a way to get you all excited about it too. Um, and how do I keep your eyes from glazing over while I'm geeking out about you know, resonance structures? 
Um, and then last but not least, how do I do as low grading as possible? Because grading is the worst part of teaching a college course um, for any of us, really. There are some assignments I don't mind grading, but man, it's the reason I get behind on grading. It's not because it takes so long, although it does. It's because it's really, really hard to stay motivated to grade, especially if it's an assignment that I don't think you all are actually doing yourselves. Um, so this goes back to my existential crises. Um, reading the same thing over reading the same thing over and over again in the same wording. I just really don't want to do that. So it's hard to stay motivated to actually stay on time with grading. Um, but you know, the natural result of a lot of this is, especially if I have a course of 400 students, I'm not going to grade the homework. You can figure out the homework yourselves and decide whether you understand it or not. All I'm grading is the final test. Um, so it, it kind of, all of these things kind of condense together lead to sort of things that aren't necessarily ideal uh, course structures for students. You know, in a smaller school, we're able to get around a lot of that stuff, but just something to think about when, for any of your college classes, all of these and more are the things every time we make a single decision about how the course is set up or what assignments to give out, we're kind of keeping all of this in mind. I think mean, it's exhausting. So just a little bit of of sort of helping you understand why we make the decisions we make sometimes. It's not just random, it's not arbitrary. If we make an art, what seems like an arbitrary decision, it's usually, there's usually a reason behind it that corresponds to one of these major questions of the whole course. Um, that's it. Feel free to question me and ask why on any of these, these arbitrary rules, um, because sometimes it's just that I don't have the time to dedicate to explaining the rule. Um, if you've ever, had a young child or relative that you needed to enforce rules with, um, it's really, really hard to not at some level just be like, this is the rule and follow the rule, please. Um, I try not to ever get so exhausted with my kids that I give them that because I said so, but it's really hard. Um, but there is a reason usually, feel free to ask. Um, all right. Let's see, we're gonna take a break here in a few minutes. Where's a good, let's talk a little bit about atomic structure before we take a break and then we'll get into how that applies to OCHEM and sort of do some, some of the history behind organic chemistry to sort of set the, set the stage where we're gonna learn. Um, so this look, should look relatively familiar. Uh, this is your Bohr model of an atom. So you've got your nucleus with a positive charge in the middle. The size of the positive charge is related to what? Protons, right? Protons are our positive particle. They're, they have mass. That was funny. Just did fly move the cursor. Um, they, uh, they're, they have mass. They have a positive charge. Electrons have, have mass, but it's about 1,600 times smaller than a proton or a neutron. So for all intents and purposes, that's in the sig figs. And we can essentially treat electrons like they have zero mass when it comes to um, rough approximations. Um, on the flip side, the nucleus has barely any volume. The volume of the nucleus is negligible compared to the volume of the electrons. So they're sort of inverse. Mass is all concentrated in one very tiny volume. And most of the volume is taken up by these electrons. Um, just for a, a size comparison, if you can picture holding a baseball on the pitching mound of a major league stadium, the baseball is roughly the size of the nucleus, and the stadium is the size of the electron clouds. Um, so when I say it's tiny compared to the electrons, it is. But now picture that the mass of that stadium is in the baseball. The entire mass of the stadium is within the baseball. It's also roughly about accurate. Um, the density of the nucleus of an atom is off the charts. It's approaching a black hole. In fact, basically dying stars that go supernova but don't have enough mass to become a black hole become a neutron star. The force of the supernova has so much energy and, and, electro and electromagnetic fields. Basically, any mole or any particle that has a charge gets blown away out into a cloud surrounding it. What's left is all the neutrons. Um, and they base, since there's no, they all have so much gravity pulling them, them together, there's no charges repelling. You basically wind up with 
with a nucleus that's roughly the size of our moon um, that has a density that's, you know, in the times 10 to the 8 grams per cubic centimeter region. That's what we call a neutron star. A neutron star is literally a giant nucleus made entirely of neutrons. Um, and it turns out, despite neutrons not having any charge, they do have a magnetic field, um, which is why if you take a neutron star and you spin it, which happens naturally as a process of some of, the, of this, you know, coagulating together, um, that's actually what a pulsar is, because when it spins, it generates a magnetic field every time it goes around. Think about the light from a lighthouse. The magnetic field goes around perpetually. And if it's spinning at a certain rate, it's more or less constant. And so we actually get really, really strong magnetic signals, radio wave signals um, from these from these neutron stars that are spinning, that's what we call the pulsar. They, they used to think it was the sign of uh, artificial or of uh, extraterrestrial life because it was so regular um, until they got until they figured out, wait, they knew a little bit more about the star life cycle and they were able to figure out, oh no, that, that actually would produce exactly what we're seeing if we just had a spinning neutron star. But anyway, uh, fun digression, but not all that relevant right now. Um, one more. So a neutron star has so much gravity and so dense that if you drop the penny from, from eye level, it would be going a measurable fraction of the speed of light by the time it hit the surface. So like in the like half to 70% of the speed of light in the five feet it takes for it to fall from eye level to the surface. Um, so they're really, really dense, really, really or, um, gravitationally attractive. All right, so the Bohr model does a pretty decent job of explaining some of the things we see and ex explain the wavelength of light that we see when electrons move from these different energy levels, right? So one of the key insights of quantum mechanics is that you can have an electron at n equals one energy level, you can have an electron at n equals two, but you can't have anything right there as far as energetically. Um, electrons can only exist at certain distances from the nucleus. And what those distances are depends on the positive charges in the nucleus here. Different positive charges, more a larger positive charge is more attractive to these electrons, which basically changes how close and far these energy levels are. Um, so that was, that was huge when they figured that out in the late 1800s. Um, or came up with this model to explain that. Um, and that's that's the lecture that, that if you had me for one-on-one, that's where we bring in the electric guitar. We talk about how you can only have resonance frequencies at certain points on the guitar neck. It's very similar to you can only have electrons at certain energy levels. The electrons behave like a wave where you have to have the ends attached to something. And that means that you can't have a wave where one end is moving up and down. And you, that limits what energies you can actually see. All right, so Bohr does a pretty good job, but he just treats them like n equals one, n equals two. Then some of the other quantum chemists came, quantum physicists came in and said, well, really within n equals two, there's actually, if we zoom in enough, this is there's actually two energy levels here that correspond with the, 2s and the 2p orbitals. The 2p orbitals are slightly higher in energy. They still have an overall similar frequency um, or similar energy, but there's a slight difference there. And so then we wind up with different, figuring out different orbital types. Right? And so then figuring out how these electrons behave comes down to following some rules that we'll talk about in a second. Um, after our break, but just to recap, um, who remembers on the periodic table how you can tell what the electron configuration is in an element? Uh, let's see. Anybody remember? Like the blocks, like the two on the left is the S block. Two on the left is the S block. So we can actually change this to electron mode. 
all the different colors correspond with adding electrons into different types of orbitals. So the row on the periodic table corresponds to corresponds to the primary energy level, that n equals one, n equals two from the Bohr model. But then when you go across the row, we go from the S block into the P block, that corresponds with we put enough, we put electrons into the energy second or the um, S orbital, and once it's filled, if we're gonna add more electrons, we have to put it into a slightly higher energy. So we put it into a P orbital. And there's rules for that, that determine how many types of orbitals you can have for each energy level. Basically, every time you add a new energy level, you add a new type of orbital. So you can't have any electrons in n equals zero. So n equals zero has zero orbitals in it. When you add, go to n equals one, you add an s orbital. When you go from one to two, you add a p orbital. When you go from two to three, you add a d orbital. Every time you go one more energy level up, you add one more type of orbital. Um, and the nice thing about this class is very, very rarely you're going to have to deal with p orbitals at all because pretty much everything that we're going to deal with is hanging out in this region and we'll do that <laughs> right there. Um, basically, we don't care about anything after argon other than as a catalyst. Um, all of the molecules we're actually going to be looking at, all the covalent bonds, all the structures are all going to be between one and 10 for the most part. Although we do add, you know, chlorine and sulfur and bromine start playing a role as we get into some of the more exotic uh, functional groups, um, which is really nice when it comes to these energy levels, right? Because the d orbitals what made everything weird, right? d orbitals where you had all the irregularities when it came to filling up, um, they fill up in normal order, except for the d orbital when a certain thing happens. Um, and 3D is filled up after the 4S, all that weirdness. We'll talk about it briefly after break, but for the most part, we're not going to worry about it. So let's take a break. I got five till, so let's come back at five after, and we will try and apply some of this stuff and uh, apply specifically to okay. Hi, Benjamin. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm sorry, Sean. Sorry for coming in late. That's okay. Okay. Awesome. But you're ready to you're ready for okay. Yeah. All right. I'm just sure I'm ready to go. So cool. And you had you had all the uh, whole Gen Chem series and everything. Sorry. The the whole Gen Chem series. No. Or are you looking for intro to okay? I think so. So what's your major? Um, mechanical engineering is what I'm going to be transferring into. So this is a second year class that you usually take after a full year of general chemistry. Um, there are engineering majors that require this this OCHEM. Is um this Chem one hundred one right? No, sorry, Chem. This is Chem two twenty one. Oh, where's one hundred one? So one hundred one is that Gen Chem series that's at lectures of one. Um, you're looking for the lab, which is out in the portables. Oh, way out there. Okay. Yeah, so it was upstairs. The, the lecture meeting will be right here at right. one at uh, one from one to three. But the lab meeting is um for this lab section is nine to noon. Um out on the floor. Down on the floor. Yeah. yeah. So that's with Carl. And he'll probably still be in there. If he's not, G2A is our offices right across the way. But actually, we got time. Um I can walk you over there. Do you know where the have you been over there before? No, I have not. Oh, cool. No worries. I'm sorry to pick your first. Oh, no worries. I can move. Thanks. That's what it's all about.
So just thought I'd pull up. So from our Canvas shell, just so everybody's seen um, how this works, to explain how I kind of build it out. Um, any announcements will show up at the very top uh, and should also you know, give you a, a notification on whatever um, device you're using. But if I need to change deadlines or add clarification to a, to a problem or anything like that, if I need to cancel class for whatever reason, um, I'll, I'll communicate all that through Canvas. Um, and then I just have it set up as a weekly schedule. So on a week to week basis, basically everything past week one, um, it's not available for you to see yet. Not because I don't trust you with it or anything. It's just that I, you know, I build it out as we go because we every class goes at a slightly different pace. Um, over on the right, if you haven't seen this on Canvas before, if you haven't turned off or something, um, the to-do list is super helpful when it comes to keeping track of your due dates and assignments that you haven't submitted. Um, if you do turn something in on paper though, um, it'll still say in your to-do list or show up as a missing assignment unless you, um, if you get rid of it by, by clearing it like that. And even then it still might show up as missing until I give you a grade. Um, but if you turn it in on paper and it still just shows up in your grade as missing or as just hyphens instead of a zero, that just means I haven't graded that assignment yet. Um, if it shows, if you know you turned it in on paper, but it shows up as zeros, then that means that I, when I graded this assignment, I could, didn't have yours and I put in a zero. So that if you are very sure you turned that assignment in, come talk to me and it's possible I put it in a different weird spot where it's possible it's still stuck together to your binder and your backpack. Um, but that's a, that's a hint that you should come talk to me about. And then if you look at any of these weekly schedules, it's usually going to look very similar. Um, I'll have links to the assignments. And then um, this is where I'll post the slides as a PDF. And then I'll put the, the lecture link once it's done rendering and uploading and everything. So you find that all on, on the week overview um, pages. And then the other the other significant one is, so this is just my, my Zoom meeting ID. If you need to get to, um, um, we need to do a Zoom meeting for whatever reason, if you're not around, um, just this will be the, the link to get to my, my meeting room. Uh, you can always get it there rather than waiting on me to get it to you if we have a range board already. And then under resources is, is gonna have um, some helpful figures, some periodic, tables, the link to the textbook download um, is the most significant one for right now. And then some of the rest of this is not as helpful um, for, for, for OCAM, it's GenCAM, um, but best for geometries, we're gonna deal with a lot. So you might want to rem uh, remind yourself how these all work. So stuff like tetrahedral versus trigonal planar versus linear. Um, but again, the nice thing with no deal rules, which means we don't really get to any of the weird geometries either, because you, in order to make something like a trigonal bipyramidal structure, basically to get past four electron groups, you need a deal rule. And we're not going to be dealing with deal rules. So for the most part, we're just going to be looking at tetrahedral and smaller. Um, but it's still good to re-familiarize yourself with that. And I think it prints, it prints well and looks, looks pretty good. But um, so when you go, when you click on the textbook download, it brings you here. Here's your, the PDF sample list, chapters one through 12, like I mentioned. Um, and this is where you will also find the full PDF once it's, once it's published. Um, to give you an idea of just how, how good the value this is, the chapters one through 12, the first third of the book, um, is 467 pages. Um, so this is a, a beast of a textbook when it's when it's all put together. Um, and so I don't know what the full printing cost will be for that, but in general, these open stacks, physical books, if you like a physical book, are pretty pretty good deal. Um, and then it does also have, you know, it defaults so big up like like this, but then it does also have bookmarks already pre-made for you, which is really, really nice, right? When it comes to finding things. Um, so just to reiterate, that's how you can find all those, those resources. 
Um, and like I said, the go back to one second. Uh, the syllabus link. Um, if you haven't looked around at the syllabus link on um, on Canvas much, uh, it'll have all the text for the syllabus here at the top. So all of the you know, boilerplate course description, all that good stuff. Um, but then underneath it, it's got the course summary, which has all of the assignments and when they're due, at least at this point, um, which is just useful for, for predicting or figuring out how much time um, you have to get done and all that good stuff. Um, so that's why assignments, I leave assignments that aren't ready for you to look at yet, as I leave them published, just limit the availability so that they still show up here in the overall plan, um, even though I don't want you necessarily going in and actually starting to work on lab three yet. Um, not that I think anybody's necessarily that ambitious or that excited about OPM, um, but they, they're they locked for a reason, basically, so I, so we can make sure you don't get stuff out of order, just because that actually can make things worse um, if you don't have the, the proper prep for the end. All right, so we're going to talk about electron configurations and orbitals a little bit more. Um, we're not going to do straight up electron configurations in OCHEM because it turns out those electron configurations that, we, that we're used to doing, doing by looking at the periodic table, those only apply to the individual atoms. When you have an atom separated from everything else, you can look at its energy and predict how all what its electron configuration is going to look like. Um, but it turns out that doesn't actually hold up. As soon as you start allowing these atoms to get close to each other and start forming bonds, that messes with all the shapes of these orbitals. So we're doing this as a review to build up to talking about hybridization. We're going to use that concept a lot. Um, does everybody remember hearing that term when you took Gen Chem, whether or not as a positive association? I remember that being one of those like, man, I'm just going to take the hit on this in the test and I'm, you know, being able to do electron configurations, that's like eight out of 10 points. I'm just going to take the hit on the last, on the two points for hybridization because I don't want to deal with figuring this out. Um, this is the point, this is why we actually emphasize it in Gen Chem because for OCHEM, hybridization changes how these things look and how they react. So we're going to do just a brief overview of the basic electronic properties so here's our rules for filling up orbitals. We're doing a electron configuration. The first rule is you start at the lowest energy and work your way up. Kind of straightforward. Like if you're pouring water into a pitcher, it fills from the bottom up, right? Because that's the lowest energy state is the bottom of the pitcher. And as you fill it up, you get to the higher energy states. Electrons do the same thing. Start low energy, build up. Um, the alpha principle comes from German, like it sounds. I, I just threw this in there because I really like the, it's always really fun German words, the way they just like slap adjectives onto the front of a noun and call it a whole new word. Um, alpha valve principle, literally the German, and it means building up principle. Alpha valve means building up. Um, so it's just the idea that if our Y axis here is energy, you're gonna start by putting electrons into the lowest energy orbital that's available. And once that's full, then you can go up to the higher energy levels. Um, however, the Pauli exclusion principle says every electron must have a unique set of quantum numbers. In other words, um, you can't have two identical indistinguishable electrons. They can't occupy the same place. It's a property of what are called fermions. Um, that they have, can't occupy the same space as each other, which kind of that actually is one of the few things that it actually does map from quantum to the real world. You can't have two objects in the same space. Um, and so each orbital is limited in how many electrons it can hold. And spin is where that you can't have two things in the same space gets weird because these two electrons that up, the electron with a spin up and a spin down, technically have the exact same shape of their orbital. They're both in the 1s orbital that has a set shape. Um, but the fact that they have opposite spin means that they can still both be in the same place at the same time without violating the Pauli exclusion principle. 
the last of those four quantum numbers is spin. And just as a brief recap, so you know what I'm talking about when I say quantum numbers. In chemistry, a lot of times we treat them like they're, we don't talk about them as numbers as often um, as physicists do. But, but the principal quantum number is just the, your energy level. So n equals one, n equals two, et cetera. The second quantum number is the type of orbital. So in chemistry, we describe that qualitatively. We say it's an S or a P or, or a D. That's so it doesn't seem like it's a number, but mathematically, each of those corresponds to a different type of function. And, it, and the, so this, the second um, quantum number is, so we can think of it as just orbital type, but numerically, it's basically how many nodes are there. Um, how many planes in that function are there um, where you have zero vibration? If you want to think about, about these probability functions like that, there's zero probability of finding um, an electron. So yeah, like in a P orbital, drawn as sort of this figure eight, right? P orbital has one node right through the middle. So it actually has, it's, it has a, a, top, or a quantum number this says it's a p orbital because it has one node. So we're going to call the secondary or the second quantum number. I think they call it the angular momentum quantum number. Um, is going to be zero, one, or two in physics speed. We're going to stick to s versus p versus d. Um, but when it comes to talking about nodes, that's why it's called a quantum number. And then three is out of the depending on the orbital type, which direction, which part of the orbital is it in? So um, let's see, orbital, a lot of times I'll call that which load is, is it in? So like for our P orbitals, there's a, there's a P orbital that goes along the X axis. There's a P orbital that goes along the Y axis. And then there's one that comes along it goes along the z-axis as well. It's coming out of the board and into the board. So the third is just like, is it in the x orbital or is it in the y orbital or is it in the z orbital? And they just put numbers to it, minus one, zero, plus one. Um, so again, something chemists typically describe qualitatively, but it actually has a mathematical number because each of these, these set of quantum numbers is describing the, the mathematical function that shows the shape of the orbital that that electron is in. So, so all of these properties that we just think of as qualitative things so far do have a mathematical impact on those functions, um, which is why they're quantum numbers. And then last, the spin. So every electron has a unique set of quantum numbers. That's the Pauli exclusion principle. You can't have one that's in the same energy level, the same orbital type, the same load, and the same spin. Physics does not allow that. Right? It's practically speaking, what that means for us is that every one of these lines is basically the first three quantum numbers put together. One is the energy level, S is the type of orbital, and then there's only one low in an S orbital. So there's one line that can hold two electrons, one spin up, one spin down. 2P has three different lows. And that means that in each of those lows represented with this, with this single line, you can have a spin up and a spin down without violating this exclusion principle. Um, and then Hund's rule, and we'll talk about these physicists or in a little bit in a second. Um, he says in case of what we call degenerate orbitals, degenerate in physics means that it has the same energy. So all three of these lobes or suborbitals of the p orbital, they're all degenerate because they're the same energy level. They're not even the same energy. They're the same energy height in our diagram. 
So if you have three options that are all identical in energy, that are all that, that are all degenerate, you start filling up each of the empty orbitals before you start doubling up. So the analogy I always use to remember this is like filling seats on a bus where everybody's a stranger. You're, nobody's going to voluntarily pair up to sit with another person um, while there are still empty seats on the bus, right? In, in, for the most part, that's also the same, that's a practical application of that same weirdness that we see from the D orbitals, where it's more stable to have everything with the same spin point in the same direction before you start doubling up, you're always going to put them in the same spin, filling all of the suborbitals before um, you start doubling them up. So what causes magnetism too is that unpaired electrons, unpaired electrons with the same spin generate a magnetic field. Um, so that's why, why we see some, some metals are magnetic and some metals aren't. And it has to do with how many unpaired electrons do you have that could have the same spin point in the same direction? So this should all relatively seem familiar, right? Nothing, nothing new here. Um, but let's talk about the history here a little bit too. Um, OCHEM is really, really kind of weird. Chemistry in general is kind of weird in that most, most fields that you have a lot of unique discoveries happening in different places worldwide. Organic chemistry and chemistry in general really started as a study in Northern Europe in the late 1600s, early 1700s, which was then followed by Northern Europe controlling the rest of the world for you know the next several hundred years um, and arguably to this day. So a lot of the famous chemists that get their names and faces in books are just old white dudes um, because they were the ones that had the power, they were the ones that had the money and the free time um, to work on this. Um, but that really starts to change to get into the 1900s. There's actually some really interesting stuff that happens um, where you start getting people interested in chemistry from outside um, wealthy white man circles. And you start seeing a lot of what we call ethnobotany, which is applying chemistry and the scientific method to um, traditional remedies of various uh, indigenous cultures around the world. So basically like taking traditional Chinese medicine to see if it's actually good, like has any value to it, to modern Western medicine. Um, and, and there's some really, really interesting stuff that happened in Brazil. Um, there was a guy on the, that GC, the gas chromatograph that we talked about earlier. One, that was one of the first instruments um, that you could make into a portable in um, form, and when I say portable, it means it was you know roughly the size of this podium was portable. Um, but then this guy who had been who had been working with all of these indigenous cultures in the Amazon um, and trying out all their different re remedies, basically took the giant portable portable GC off the Amazon in a dugout canoe and started testing plants, just throw plants into it and see what comes out, and found like a huge number of of um, compounds that wound up becoming modern pharmaceuticals or deriving modern you know, pharmaceuticals from them. Um, so it's, it's, it was really cool in the 19, uh, eight, yeah, 1900s um, when we started seeing like, hey, we don't have to just apply this to Northern Europe and the wealthy parts of the US. There's really cool organic chemistry happening everywhere. Um, but it means that we still have to deal with the chemistry also has a very problematic history um, in that these are some of the founders of organic chemistry. Friedrich Wohler was the first one who coined the term organic chemistry because he accidentally made urea um, from inorganic compounds. Up to that point, they thought that anything carbon-based had to be made from a living organism, which is where the term organic comes from. Um, Friedrich Wohler was trying to find a new way to make, I think he was trying to make like potassium thiocyanate or something, and he accidentally made urea not an organic compound, not from a living organism. So he's like, wait, we can, we can do that. This is allowed. And then organic chemistry was a thing. Um, August Kukuli um, came up with the idea of, of uh, electronic resonance. Um, and he was, he was kind of a jerk about it. 
um, because he claims that he had this, it just came to him in a dream. It's literally what he told um, the when he first published. Uh, but really, it was because he'd been reading up on this concept of the Ouroboros, the serpent that eats its own tail, which is prominent in a lot of Egyptian and African cultures. Um, but he didn't want to say that he was got the idea from an African culture. That would not be okay in the 1800s. So he said, I just dreamed it. It came to me in a dream. Um, and it wasn't until his journals became publicly available when he died that he actually um, got the correct attribution there. Um, Alfred Nobel founded the Nobel Prize, first to synthesize TNT um, and find a practical application for it. He figured out if you make a TNT, trimetrotoluene, and you soak sawdust in it, and then you bind that up into a tube, you have a really, really convenient way to blow rocks up. Um, so that's, he invented dynamite. Uh, and it made him so much money, but then, it, you know, that's the other thing about dynamite is, it doesn't just get used for blowing up rocks. It can kind of blow up whatever you want to blow up. Um, so he actually was known as the Merchant of Death um, was his nickname. He didn't know that that was his nickname until there was an explosion in one of his factories and his brother died. And a, um, a newspaper, I think in the UK, this was in Sweden, a newspaper in the UK heard that Nobel died in an in a, uh, explosion and published his obituary. Um, it should have been for his brother, but it's actually his, but it was the like, Merchant of death dies, his legacy of terror and ends or so young will go on to define Europe or something like that. And he read that, he's like, I don't want to be the merchant of death. Like, that's awful. I didn't know people say that about um, it. So, so he founded the Nobel Prize using the money that he earned selling dynamite um, as a way to sort of put money back into science and rehabilitate his own reputation, um, which worked because when you hear Nobel now, you think Nobel Prize, not merchant of death. Um, and then, you know, we have just a bunch of just, pardon my French, plain out assholes um, in the mid, mid 1900s, especially in Germany was like a hotbed of organic chemistry research in the early 1900s. So there's a lot of people we have to talk about that were just plain out Nazis, literally Nazis. Um, they, I mean, where do you think all the Zyklon B that they used to kill, um, you know, millions and millions of people came from, came from the chemists. Um, so there's a very much a problematic history with organic chemistry. Um, and, you know, partly I bring this up because, it's, you know, we can't not acknowledge that chemistry has been used in really, really horrible things. So it's a lot of technology, right? I use this as an example, a way to say technology is not inherently good or bad. Technology in the hands of assholes is bad. Technology used for the betterment of society is wonderful, right? Nuclear reactors versus nuclear bombs. Same technology, different application. Um, so, you know, I periodically, I will try and focus on the positives, but sometimes I will just tell you, dude was straight up not a good person um, because I don't want to pretend like it didn't happen. Um, chemists were people too. But it turns out that's not just old white dudes. It's mostly white, mostly dead, mostly dudes. Um, but you do have Marie Curie. Percy LeVon Julian actually was really instrumental in um, I think the, the development of cortisone, artificial steroids, um, and various medications like Lipitor are all based on his research. He found a way to isolate various steroid molecules from uh, plants. And he actually went to Bruce's alma mater. Um, so Bruce actually did all of his chemistry classes in Julian Hall. Um, and at first, let's see, one of the, I think he was the first African American to win a Nobel Prize in chemistry and the second to win Nobel Prize period. Um, so really, really bright, brilliant guy. Um, Fukui is won his Nobel Prize about 20 years later than he probably should have, um, because it turns out after World War II, um, Europe and America didn't really care for Japan for a few decades after that. And so they weren't gonna give the Nobel Prize to a Japanese dude, even though they gave Nobel Prizes to people that were his contemporaries, that did the same research as him in, in Europe. It took him an extra 20 years and they had to make up 
Um, it was for this research, but really it was for the research he did 20 years earlier that he should have been given a Nobel Prize, shared a Nobel Prize 20 years earlier. Um, but he did some really cool stuff. When we get to well, at the end of the second quarter, we talk a lot about his research. On, he did a lot of work with molecular orbitals. Um, Asima Chatterjee did a ton of work with that ethnobotany, kind of isolating molecules and trying to find modern uh, pharmaceutical uses. And then Kuhn is one of those just plain out assholes. Um, not just a Nazi sympathizer, he didn't just put his head down, he actually turned in his Jewish co-workers um, to the Nazis during the Holocaust, um, to the point where yet yeah, he's won two Nobel Prizes, now one Nobel Prize and some, several other prizes. Um, and they, there was a German institute that used to give out the Kuhn Medal, is basically the highest award for chemistry in Germany. Um, and they have since totally stripped his name of that because they straight point by and say, he is not a role model. Therefore, we are not associating his name with us anymore. Um, so it's just chemists are people, fall, deeply flawed people a lot of times. And I don't want to gloss over that because yeah, don't just assume because you see their name in the textbook that they're uh, somebody that you should emulate or use as a role model. Anyway, getting back to doing electronic orbitals. This is one of those cases where I see the opportunity to go on a brief tangent, seize it, and then we have to come back to where we started. Um, but as long as we're talking about all these random names and rules, um, how do we do the electron configuration of carbon here? How many electrons does carbon have? It's got it's got four valence electrons. I don't have we don't have a periodic table in here. Um, you'll get to know the basic the first two rows of the periodic table to the point where you don't need to think about them anymore. But carbon is atomic number six, so when it's neutral, it has six electrons. So we just start at the bottom two per per orbital until we get to a total of six. Don't double up before they're all filled. Cool. Easy enough, right? Electron configurations. I'm sure this is going to be super helpful. Um, turns out it is to some extent. Um, the other thing we want to consider is the octet rule, which is the idea that it says octet meaning eight, and for the first two rows of the periodic table, that's true. Um, but really, it's the idea that things are most stable, um, are energetic, and when I say stable, I mean energetically favored when you can have only full or empty orbitals. So fluorine is really, really unstable because it has one vacancy. It really wants to get one electron to fill that energy level. And when you have only full energy levels, everything gets more stable. So fluorine needs to gain one electron. If it can't steal an electron, like making an ionic bond, what do we get instead? What's the other option other than ionic? Covalent, right? Ionic means that you have something that wants to give away an electron to be stable and something that wants to gain an electron to be stable. So it's win-win. Everybody wins, right? Sure, I, didn't, I wasn't using this anyway. I don't want it. They're in my garage for me. Here, you have the electron. Um, covalent bonds, though, are when you have a, an electron that two atoms want to hold on to at the same time. So I think of it as sharing electrons. Um, it literally, and again, it's, I've said this before, but it's, it's embarrassing how long it took me to realize that the word covalent comes from in two valences simultaneously. The cohabitate, covalent, it's two valences at the same time. Um, so literally, if you have a gap and you have something else that needs to gain electrons, you can share them, overlap those orbitals. And the electrons that are in both orbitals, that are in that orbital can be in both valences at the same time. Easy way to make everybody happy, right? Uh, let's just practice. Yeah. Can we not get into, sorry, I thought we were kind of different. This is what I want to talk about next. 
So Linus Pauling is the one who came up with that idea that you get these or these bonds forming when you have atomic orbitals overlapping. Um, Linus Pauling is is worthy of being a role model. The guy is awesome. He's won two Nobel Prize, one of only two people, I guess three now after last year. Um, one of only three people that's ever won two Nobel Prizes. And only two, two of them, Pauling and Curie, won two Nobel Prizes in two different fields. Um, Curie got a Nobel Prize in physics and Nobel Prize in chemistry. Linus Pauling got a Nobel Prize in chemistry and a Nobel Peace Prize um, for his work on nuclear disarmament during the 60s. Big hippie. Um, this is, he lives in, I think he's still alive. Yeah, he lived forever in Big Sur, um, all the way going back to the 70s when Neil Young and all the all the folk rockers lived in Big Sur. Um, he used to hang out with them, go to dinner with them. Um, really fun guy. Um, and actually, any of you know uh, Aria Pauling? He's a student here um, a couple years ago. Um, she's actually his great niece. Um, which was really cool. I, you know, totally starstruck when I heard that. Like, you, you knew Linus Pauling's guys from Linus. Um, anyway, he was the guy, the one who came up with the idea. Not only do these atomic orbitals overlap, but the problem with that is if we go back to looking at carbon, partially filled orbitals overlapping is how you make bonds. That idea doesn't really work though because they already knew carbon made four bonds, but it only has two partially filled orbitals. So how the heck does it have four bonds forming if it only has two partially filled orbitals? And so Pauling was the one who came up with the idea of hybridization. If it's energetically favorable to make bonds to fill your valence, you can actually mix these two functions together and instead of just having S orbitals and P orbitals in their distinct shapes, you can make other shapes by, by literally taking, if you've ever, you know, when you take math class, if you remember thinking about, you could have a function that was, we call it H. H of X is equal to F of X plus G of X. We made a new function by adding two existing functions, right? Pauling was the one who said, well, that's a function and that's a function. It means we can mix them together. Basically, as long as the, the sum of their coefficients adds up to one, it is still going to hold two electrons. It's still going to behave like an orbital. But we can change the shape of it if we mix them together. So that's actually what hybridization is. It's mathematically, it's saying, okay, well, if we take three p orbitals and one s orbital and we add their functions together, we take that the function that represents the px sub x as a function of radius usually um, times 0 0.25 plus 0 0.25 times p sub y plus 0 0.25 times p sub z plus 0 0.25 times what? It's the last one we have that we can mix together. We got all three pieces of the P. That S or is the other one we're going to mix together. Each of those are just functions. So we can actually say, okay, it's a quarter PX, it's a quarter PY, it's a quarter PZ, and it's a quarter S or. And we get a totally new function that instead of looking like, let's see, here's our X, Y, and Z axes. Instead of looking like any of them, it kind of looks like Sorry, it's in between the two, the X and the Y axes. And it's not a full figure eight anymore. It's sort of like pooched over to the side. By mixing these different orbitals together, we get a different shape. And now we have four different directions. They, they naturally orient themselves. If you do this, you do this function and look at the four possibilities that add up. Um, you wind up with a tetrahedral shape. They naturally overlap in a way that gives you a tetrahedral shape. So the, mixing these different functions together is what allows us to get more than two bonds per carbon. Right? And we'll keep working on that because that's a, a weird concept and we'll define hybridization. 
Um, as well, we have 10 minutes left. Um, who remembers doing Lewis Dodd's structures? Ish. Right? Counting total number of valence electrons. We're only going to deal with valence electrons in this class. Four electrons are so stable as they are, we're just gonna, they're never going to change anything. Figure out what goes in the middle, place the remaining atoms. Arrange the electrons you have left until everything has a full valence, right? The hybridization is what allows that to happen. So otherwise, you'd be stuck with carbon only is allowed to make two bonds, and they would have to be 90 degrees from each other, as opposed to making those more complicated electron geometries. The one here that I really want to look at, let's look at uh, is C2H6. How do we do a Lewis dot structure for C2H6? Right, so before we get there, ignore C2H6 for a second. Why do we care about the Lewis dot structure in terms of like properties or things that we could actually measure? What did the Lewis dot structure determine? How many bonds, how many bonds it has? How many things it has taking up space around that middle atom, right? Is the number of things, number of bonds, and the number of lone pairs determine what the shape of the molecule is, right? That's how we got tetrahedral geometry, was when we have eight electrons around the carbon, we need to arrange them in a way so that they can all stay out of each other's way. What do we get with C2H6? What do we put in the middle? Bond. Yeah, what we really wind up seeing in this case is what well, we have normally we would say, okay, well, you take your your least electronegative element is the one that goes in the middle, then you arrange everything else around it, right? We try that here one, not only do we have two that are identical to each other. We wind up with we wind up with like seven things attached, right? Six hydrogens, one, two, three, four, five. Six hydrogens and a carbon all attached to one center carbon. There's no way you can do that in a way that makes sense when it comes to arranging the, re the remaining electrons. Plus, in order to make that many bonds, you have to have a deal. You have to have something that you can mix in there that can allow it to make more than four bonds. So instead, if we're limited to only S's and P's, meaning we're limited to tetrahedral structures, nothing is going to have more than four um, electron groups around it. So that's what Zeke meant when he said you put a bond, the bond goes in the middle, because if you, if you treat each of these carbons like it's a central atom and say, okay, well, now I can arrange the hydrogens around each of the carbons. So yes, technically, by the way, we have it drawn. There's a bond in the middle. So I should have rephrased it as, what's the central atom? Which one is the central atom? When it comes to determining um, molecular geometry. Oh, right? You get this whole thing we would call an ethyl group. We're gonna get into organic nomenclature soon enough. But when it comes to molecular geometries, Anything with more than one electron group is going to have its own molecular geometry. So each of these is a central atom. We could look at both of them and say, well, there's four electron groups around that carbon. Therefore, it's tetrahedral. There's four electron groups around this carbon. That carbon is also tetrahedral. To get an overall shape of the molecule. So molecular geometry, the way you learned it in gen chem, is sort of a misnomer because it's not actually the entire molecule's geometry. It's the geometry of one specific atom within a larger structure sometimes. Right? And so that's the key to OCHEM. It's going to be all of our Lewis dots. We're going to stop calling them Lewis dot structures um, because for the most part, everything's limited to having four electron groups. And we can figure out just based on what the formal charge is of, um, of the structures, whether or not or how many bonds it needs versus lone pairs. We're going to just say, instead of saying, you know, doing this every time and counting electrons every time, we just can say, oh, it's carbon 
It has four vacant spots in its valence, therefore it will make four bonds. Versus nitrogen is next to carbon on the periodic table, right? So nitrogen, if we wanted to say CH3, NH2, we could wind up with a, so nitrogen's right here. We could do a, an electron or a um, Lewis dot structure. And what we're going to wind up with is the nitrogen gets a long pair. So what we're going to wind up doing is instead of going to counting valence electrons and distributing the right way every time and then figuring out with whether the, the last hydrogen goes on carbon or nitrogen um, by doing formal charge every single time, the shorthand in organic chemistry is you look at how many vacancies it has, that's how many bonds it's going to make. And you're going to fill the rest of the valence is going to be filled with lone pairs. So oxygen has two valences, or sorry, has two um, vacancies in its valence. So it can make two bonds and the rest of its eight electrons are going to be made of our lone pairs. So what's changed from Gen Chem is that instead of counting electrons, Electrons, we're going to assume everything is neutral unless otherwise specified, which allows us to say, okay, I've got an oxygen, and unless I'm told otherwise, it's neutral, therefore it must have two bonds and two lone pairs. And it starts being a lot faster than doing this by hand every time and counting valence electrons and arranging them every time. You're able to just say carbon, four bonds, four vacancies, four bonds, because it's neutral. If you had a carbon with a charge on it, that's going to change how many bonds it can make. But we'll get to all that soon enough. It's just we're going to sort of switch gears. It's still rooted in the same logic as our uh, Lewis dot structures, um, but we're going to sort of approach it from a different way and use it in sort of a shorthand. So here's the slide of what I just said. If we change the frame of reference, if we assume every molecule is neutral unless specified, and we're assuming every atom has a full valence unless specified. That allows us to just go based on how many bonds, how many vacancies tells you how many bonds, and you make up the difference with lone pairs, whether or not they're explicitly stated um, in the in the uh, formula. Right. So carbon makes four, nitrogen makes three, oxygen makes two. Um, it gets a little bit weird if you go the other way. If you look at boron, boron has five vacancies. Um, but it's weird because uh, it's less than halfway filled, which is one of the reasons why we stick mostly to the non-metals. Um, turns out you can make boron stable, and we'll talk about this when we get to reactions. Boron can actually be stable without a complete octet if there are literally not enough electrons around. If you have BH3, BH3 only has a total of six electrons to work with. So you can't fill a valence if you only have six electrons, right? Um, or if you have something really, really electronegative like fluorine, fluorine won't share with boron more than normal, um, no matter what, because boron's just not strong enough and the fluorine is too strong. So you can actually wind up with BH3 winds up being trigonal planar and it actually has an empty P orbital. It doesn't have a full valence, but that's stable enough we can actually make it. It's called boring. Um, so there are some weird things when you get into the really extreme cases. Um, but we will get to those down the road. So in class today, or in lecture lab, we have an hour off, um, lab at one, bring a computer. Um, it's just going to be practice building molecules, looking stuff up, playing with mole view mostly is how is the main tool we're going to use to do that. Um, and it's just going to be a case your, your lab write up is going to be, I made this molecule that fits the criteria that you asked for, and you're going to screenshot it and put it in a word doc. Um, so pretty straightforward, um, just practice using your computer to make these, some of these structures and thinking about different ways we can arrange the atoms, thinking more than just there's one center atom. Okay. So one o'clock, I'll be over there. Uh, if you need to talk to me between now and then, feel free to come find my office. Does everybody know where the G buildings are with the laptop? Okay. Um, and 
also selling point, if you stick through this series all the way through the third quarter, you probably get to be the first OCHEM chem class in the new labs. Um, the schedule that I'm tentatively hoping is, is accurate. I didn't dare my, let myself hope that we'd stick to the original schedule. That never happens. Um, but in theory, sometime in the middle of the winter quarter, we're going to be able to start moving into the new lab. Um, and which means spring quarter, we'll be able to do play with all the new toys and, and you know, have a nice, fresh lab. So stick it out. And uh, that'll be a lot of fun. But in the meantime, we're still stuck in the old dance studio. Um, that's the plan at this point. Things may shift a little bit, but but yeah, that's that's the plan. Uh, if it's not me, it'll probably be Carl. Yeah, because you mentioned that you'd be doing the third class. That could be. So we'll have to look at it. Um, but it's always up in the air. It's always up in the air a little bit, but he has now taught. He taught the whole series last year, so he's taught the whole series. I've taught the whole series. It's more my field, um, but if for whatever reasons of scheduling doesn't work out, um, then he might do it again. That's you know we have that option. Any other questions about class stuff, syllabus class stuff? You can go over anything you want to in uh, in lab as well. We're just going to go over the lab safety contract, which I'm sure you all sit hearing at this point, but uh, we'll do that as well so that we can.